Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is gonna be something a little different, but something I wanted to do for a while. Uh, I've talked about it on here before, but my TikTok was mostly history for a long time. I'm trying to just do more like whatever I want in it. Um, and my Instagram is mostly makeup, but I really wanted to meld those two together. And so I've been starting to do it on those platforms, but I haven't done it here. So today's International Women's Day. Unfortunately, I won't edit this up for International Women's Day, but I wanted to spend the day doing a get ready with me and talking a little bit about Freddie and Trush Oversteegen and Hanny Shaft, who were Dutch resistance fighters and the only female Dutch resistance fighters in the Harlem resistance in the Netherlands against Nazi Germany. I also cut my hair and um, I'm trying to learn how to style it or something because uh, I don't know about anybody else, when I get my hair cut, I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, is this me? <laughs> I don't really know. I've been doing a lot of research on these women because I'm writing a play about them. I, a friend of mine had shown me, had pointed me in the direction of these women, but their story was so captivating. I like could not get it out of my head. Um, so I'm writing a play, so I'm doing a lot of research, including reading an autobiography of one of these women, Trush, uh, that was recently translated into English, which is incredible for me. So we're gonna start with the Oversegans, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about Henny Shaft. So, Freddie and Trush Oversegan were just 14 and 16 years old when the Nazis invaded and occupied the Netherlands in 1941. But these women were raised on doing the right thing, and prior to the war, their mother, who also was nicknamed Trush, but their mother was hiding Jewish refugees from Germany in their home, which was illegal back then. They were not occupied at this time, but the Dutch government did not want that happening in the 1930s. So when this happened, of course, these women who had been resisting will continue to do so. Um, so Freddie and Trush engaged in protests and also the handing out of illegal magazines that their mother was printing or stenciling in the living room. I'll insert a picture here, all from this book I was reading of the stencil machine, uh, but essentially she would be making copies of resistance magazines and the girls would hand them out. And because they were women, and this was a highly sexist time in history, as if it's not always, but the men weren't really looking at these women as threats. So they were doing these dangerous work, but then their lives changed in that year, 1941, when they met a man named Franz van der Weyl. Franz van der Weyl. He was the regional commander of the Harlem resistance and he came to the girls and asked them to take on more dangerous work. I have to remember to do my makeup in the middle of this. I get so excited to talk about history. I'm just gonna... And um, even before they were into serious work, there was consequences for being a part of any type of resistance. And um, obviously you never wanted to be noticed. The mom was not like directly a part of the resistance, but did some resistance work and knew some resistance people. But when they met Franz van der Weyl, they didn't know who he was. And because it was such a period of secrecy, of lying, of trying to gain trust and turn people in, they were nervous about Franz at first because he asked them to take a more dangerous work. He literally, went to Freddie and Trush and was like, could you shoot someone to death? To which Freddie replied, quote, that's something I've never done before. And so once their mother got word that this man was legit, they said yes. So the second time Freddie and Trush met Franz, um, <laughs> he pointed a gun at them and said, just kidding, I'm actually from the Gestapo and um, I was lying to you and now you need to give up names of Jewish men or I'll harm you basically. To which Freddie and Trush did not take that sitting down. They actually literally fought him. They were hitting him. They beat him up according to her, uh, her autobiography, like pretty damn good. Um, to which he finally had to be like, whoa, whoa. Okay guys, you passed the test. I actually am not the Gestapo. I was just making sure that you could be trusted. And Freddie was not super happy about that, but that was their test to get into the resistance that they passed. Their type of work was no longer just handing out resistance magazines. Um, they were 
committing acts of sabotage. One of, <laughs> in her autobiography, Trish says one of her favorite missions was when she sabotaged a railway line. She said it was really, really fun for her. So they were sabotaging railway lines. They were forging documents to get Jewish families and Jewish children out of the Netherlands. They were also uh, smuggling these people out of the Netherlands. They also were engaged in um, liquidation missions. It's another word for like an assassination, but they strictly called it liquidations. Um, now we're gonna move to Henny Shaft. So Henny didn't join the Harlem resistance until 1943 when she was 19 years old. But before that, she was a student. She was actually studying law at university when the uh, occupation happened and the invasion. And a few things happened in the Netherlands regarding school. At one point, the teachers and government leaders had to sign a loyalty pledge to Germany. So the first piece of resistance that Hanny was involved in um, was something called February Strike in 1941. Um, and it was the first large-scale act of resistance against Germany in the Netherlands. Then in February of 1943, two years later, students were made to sign, sign that same loyalty pledge that professors and government officials were made to pledge to Germany, except 85% of the students did not sign that pledge, meaning university life all but came to a halt. And Hanny was one of the women who refused to sign this pledge. It is thought, though, that she finished her degree by listening to illegal uh, lectures that were taking place in like train stations and taking illegal exams, which is also what a badass form of like civil resistance. But in 1943, she officially joined the Harlem resistance. She was doing some resistance work in Amsterdam, but she wanted to do more. And so they put her in contact with Franz. And her first job was to kill a Nazi SM, which is a Nazi officer, but not an SS officer. They're two different distinctions. So Franz set her up with another resistance member to go on this mission together. And um, they stalked this man. And when it was time for her to shoot, she did, but the gun was holding a blank. And actually the person that she was supposed to shoot was Franz. He was posing as an SM officer to test Hanny. Imagine like you're going to shoot someone, like you shoot them, right? and nothing happens. And then the guy you're supposed to shoot turns around is like, you passed. That's how I envisioned in my head it went. Um, and she was reportedly as upset as Freddie was with their test, but she passed and joined the resistance. I mentioned earlier that Freddie and Trisha's mom was... Now I mentioned earlier that Freddie and Trisha... Now I had mentioned earlier that Freddie and Trusha's mom was printing resistance magazines in the living room and eventually she was discovered or someone ratted her out that it was her and she needed to move to East Netherlands. And so Freddie and Trush went with her because things were starting to get hot, right? And people were starting to get suspicious so they needed to lay low for a little bit. So Freddie and Trush became hospital nurses out in this Eastern part of the Netherlands. And Franz was like, you know what? I think Hanny and Freddie and Trush would be a great team together. Hanny, why don't you go and meet Freddie and Trush at this hospital? And so she went and posed as a nurse. I'm sorry, this also is gonna sound ridiculous. And you're gonna be like, Megan, this, there's no way this is true, but it is. So she posed as a nurse and she went up to Freddie and Trush and she said, Franz sent me. But remember, this is a time of deep deception, of a lot of anxiety, and um, so they were like, so they went into a side room and each one had a hand in the pocket because Freddie and Trush always carried a gun on them and Franz told Hanny this, so Hanny brought her gun. So they were all in this like stalemate of like, are we gonna pull guns? Are we gonna pull guns? And they were staring at each other. And then reportedly from Trusha's autobiography, she said after 15 minutes, she started busting out laughing and realized like the hilarity of the situation and they became fast friends after it. Though Freddie did say in an interview that she was a little bit jealous when Hanny joined the resistance because they were no longer the only women in the Harlem resistance, which I think is just an interesting little tidbit. But these women did often team up and Franz was right, they were a great trio. So Hanny was the intellectual, Trush was the leader, and then um, 
Freddie was the intelligence. So she would go and map out places before, let's say they had a mission, she would go and make sure she knew where everything was and ways out in case something happened. And she was really, really good at her job, Freddie was, and so was Trush. Even though Hanny was older, Trush was just a better leader. Um, and they really complemented each other in their work. Their most famous mission that they went on is um, dressing up as what was called, I'm probably mispronouncing this word, but Moffin Girls. And Moffin Girls were Dutch women that had relations with German soldiers and they were super, super hated. <laughs> like after the war ended, they actually shaved off Moffin Girls hairs in like the court squares. But they dressed up as Moffin Girls and Franz helped them put on makeup and get ready and they would flirt with Nazi officers, um, they would smile, they would laugh, they would, you know, like butter them up and then sometimes they would seduce them, lure them into the nearby woods where either they would liquidate them or a member of the resistance was waiting to liquidate them. And I do want to mention here that like if you're thinking like these people are, let's say, you know, Trush is 18 by this point, but these German soldiers are so much older. Yes, that is exactly what happened. A lot of these men were in their 50s looking at 18 year old and uh, Freddie was 16, 16 to 18 year old girls, which is still really fucking creepy and really gross. Just to put that out there. I'm going to like go on to a little tangent now about like the missions that Trush went on by herself because um, after the war, like, she was primarily the sister to speak on their uh, resistance activity. Freddie pretty much didn't speak about that time until after Trush passed when she was um, 91 years old because Trush passed when she was 93. So we don't have a lot of, like, specifics from Freddie, but we have a lot of specifics from Trush because she not only published a book but also went and talks about it. So. Trush was primarily the person to work with children. And um, this was because Freddie, even though she was 16, you know, in 1943, she still looked like she was 12. Like they often say that she looked so, so young. So it didn't really make sense for her to be working with children since uh, Trush looked older. Like it didn't look funky that she was like holding these children's hands and like directing them places. It just looked like a mother and their child, you know what I mean? Because she could dress up and look way older. But these missions often did not go well. And in the book I'm reading her autobiography, which is titled Not Then, Not Now, Not Ever, she goes into really great detail about this one mission that really stuck with her. The guise was that these Jewish children were really ill and they were being shipped off somewhere to not infect other children. So. Trush was dressed up as a Nazi woman who was taking these children via a train to somewhere. And she was supposed to have another resistance member come and help her, but they never showed up. So she did this all on her own. These children are terrified and she has to act very much like a Nazi soldier. She was yelling, she had to strike one of the children. And after, and she was nervous, like this was, Trush was very honest in her book about how much she hated the work she was doing, how she always like threw up after or had really bad shakes or sweats or anxiety. Like this was not fun for any of these women, but this was a necessity and they knew that what they were doing, even though they hated it, was necessary work. So she was really anxious because she was doing this all on her own. And when she was out of the eyes of the Germans, she was trying to explain to these kids, like, I'm on your side, I'm on your side, I promise you, like, I'm not actually a German, I'm not actually this person. Which I don't know if the kids ever understood, but then after they got off the train, they had to make it through this, like, minefield with barbed wire fence and a resistance member was supposed to take down a piece of the barbed wire for them to get through and then make a map of the minefield. And while they made a map of the minefield, they didn't take down the barbed wire fence well enough. So Trush had to make work on the fly that and then get these children to go through. And the children were getting restless. They were kids, you know, they were kids. 
but eventually they all got through the minefield and then they had to wait in the grass. There was a German searchlight around the area and they were supposed to get into a boat at a specific time and um, they would be safe to leave. But the children were getting really antsy. They were making a lot of noise, they were crying and Trush was really afraid of being discovered. So she decided, let's just go to the boat now which ended up being the wrong decision because they all got onto the boat and they started moving and the Germans spotted them and they ended up shooting a hole in the hole in the boat and the boat ended up capsizing with all of the children in it in going into the water and um Trush talks about how the children went in and they're getting fired at and she tried to save these children but she couldn't, so she'd go up for air, she tried to save another child, she couldn't get them, she'd go back, and then the Germans came, so she swam to shore, and she was gonna go back again, but she couldn't, and none of the children survived. And she talks about, like, what a heavy toll that left on her, because, like, even though these children, if they were caught by the Germans, they would have died anyway, it was, like, it was difficult work. So I have a quote from her that I'm gonna read about her experience and why she was doing what she was doing. Okay, quote. A war like this is a very raw experience. While I was biking, I saw Germans picking up innocent people from the streets, putting them against the wall and shooting them. I was forced to watch, which aroused such an enormous anger of me, such a disgust, a feeling of dirty bastards. You can have any political conviction or be totally against war, but at that moment, you're just a human being confronted with something very cruel. Shooting innocent people is murder. If you experience something like this, you'll find it justified that when people commit treason, such as exchanging a four-year-old Jewish child for 35 guilders, which was Dutch currency, you act against it. These are such scary people who only look at what's in it for them, even if it's a human being. And she also tells um, this one story about the specific time where she like disobeyed and, or well, she acted without a direct order. She was walking the streets and this German soldier came up to this family. It was a father, a young daughter, and then a baby. And the baby was in the carriage. He took the baby out of the carriage and started slamming it against the wall. And the father and the, the sister were screaming and begging for this man to stop. And he didn't stop until the child was completely bloody and, and killed. And then he threw it back into the carriage, took out a gun and shot the other little girl, leaving the father with, with nobody. Trush said in that moment, I took out a gun and I shot him. It wasn't an order and I don't regret it. I can't imagine what it's like to grow up in that environment or to watch those things happen. And the bravery of these kids to stand up to this establishment where standing up to these Germans still meant death. Like people were still being taken to jail, people were still being executed, but it was a time of such unbelievable cruelty. And something that I think personally we're seeing again in the world where the cruelty is coming back because it seems like the individualism is on the rise and we forget about the collective people that we're all, at the end of the day, human beings on this earth care about the collective us because individualism is going to be the, the ruin of this nation. So Hanny had become infamous as the woman with the red hair because she had this striking red hair. And I mean infamous in that Hitler literally put out a call for her head. Like he wanted her killed, he wanted her captured, he wanted her executed and like to be noticed by the Fuhrer, you have to be doing something that's really disruptive of his plans. So she dyed her hair black and she started dressing up. I think I have a picture of Trush and Hanny over here in disguises and she continued to do missions. She was, however, found out to be Hanny Shaft because of a mission gone wrong. Like she was the woman with the red hair until this mission. So she was on a mission with this guy, Jan. John, Jan, I'm not really sure. And they were sent to liquidate an asset. And how they were doing this is they were going on their bikes. They were supposed to find the person, shoot him and walk away. But this asset shot back 
and shot Jan in the stomach. They didn't kill the asset and she thought Jan had died. So she rode away on her bike and she actually went to Freddy and was like, something bad happened. Um, you know, Jan's dead. What unbeknownst to her, to them, was that Jan survived. The Germans took him to the hospital and dressed up some nurses as resistance fighters. And he was, he lost so much blood and he was in such bad shape. He believed that these uh, Germans were actually resistance fighters and gave up Hanny's name and Hanny's address. So the Germans went after her family and they took the family, they kidnapped them and took them to the concentration camp Vought, V-U-G-H-T. Um, and Hanny was so distraught over this because she was staying in safe houses with Freddie and Trouche that she almost turned herself in. And if it wasn't for Freddie and Trouche being like, you absolutely can't turn yourself in, she definitely would have done it. Her family though did not know anything about her uh, dealings with the resistance. So eventually after nine months, they were freed from the concentration camp. But Hanny was captured because of a routine check. From what the book tells me, there were these like random inspection spots and typically the resistance knew where they're going to be so you did not bike near them but this one was not known and hanny had already been seen so she couldn't bike the other way she had to go up and they asked to open her bike bag and in her bike bag was a resistance magazine so they immediately arrested her what they did not see is below that was also a gun she always carried a gun on her very much like freddie and Trush. So she was taken to prison and in prison, she had to wash out her black hair, her black dye. And that's when they realized who they had captured. Um, and this was two weeks before the end of the war. And the book that I was reading, um, which I'll put sources at the very end of this, or actually I'll put them in the description box below, but it told me that they weren't really executing prisoners at this point. So it's very strange that they ended up executing Hanny. They uh, took her to a hole, I guess they had dug her a grave, and then they went to shoot her. And they went to shoot her the first time and it missed, it skimmed her. And her last words reportedly were, idiots, I shoot better than you. And then they shot her and killed her. And like I said, Freddie and Trush knew she was captured, but did not know that she was dead until after the war. <laughs> So after the war, they went to the prison where Hanny was and they uh, couldn't find her. And then it was discovered that she had been, she had been killed. Now after the war, Hanny was honored right away. She actually has a statue and a foundation. That's where I bought Trush's book. And Trush was the person who um, created the statue. She ended up becoming a sculptor, a sculptor. And she sculpted a bunch of resistance sculptures throughout Europe and the world but after the war like it really took a toll on these girls what i didn't tell you is that through all of these missions and through all these things i mentioned a little bit that like trush struggled but they all struggled you know um hanny had severe depression after the jan incident um because he had died um freddie and trush had nightmares they talked about these nightmares often that they could see the people that they killed over and over again. And um, at one point, you know, Freddie, I mean, at one point, Trush even went into a mental institution because of this. Freddie's children say that the war didn't end for her until she died. Such a profound and sad statement. So they dealt with the effects of being resistance fighters for the rest of their life but also they were communists. And pretty much a lot of resistance groups in Europe at this time were communists. But because they were clearly tied to communism, their mother was a communist as well, they were denied the resistance pension that everyone got for working in the resistance until the 1960s because of anti-communist sentiment that came out in the Netherlands after the West like liberated them, or Great Britain, I guess, the Allied powers liberated them. There was a heavy and high anti-communist sentiment um, to the point that Trush had a family and she got married, so did uh, Freddie. That's all Freddie wanted to do after the war. She just wanted to get married and have babies. That was literally a quote from her. 
but Trush and her family had to like hide at one point because they were threatening them because of their communist ties and Freddie never really talked about if she was communist but Trush was very open that she was. What a scary time, you fought for this world and now it's turning on you. It feels like, if I can just be a, a historian for a minute here, what they fought for was freedom from this fear of the unknown. Like I think a big part of why the Nazis took rise is that there's a power in othering people. Like if you other a group of individuals so much that you don't believe that they're human, it's a very powerful thing. And you can unite a group of people against that fear of somebody else. But is that not exactly what the United States did and Great Britain after World War II with communism? They were afraid of communism. They didn't understand communism. And so it felt, it feels like to me in reading their words, and I'm just gonna hypothesize that the West made the same mistakes, like America made the same mistakes that Nazis did in a different way. And I could get into like the second red scare in the United States and how tumultuous and deadly that was. But yeah, they were denied aid until 1960s uh, that everyone else got and they were not formally recognized for their work in the resistance until 2014, 70 years later. Yeah, and that's pretty much all I had. I talked more than I did makeup. Let me finish up my makeup really quick. I talked about this a little bit on my Instagram today. A question that came up for me when I was learning history in college was who decides what history deserves to be remembered and what gets lost? I started wondering about this, like, why do we remember certain people and why are they remembered or who is deemed worthy of remembrance? When I read this book called The Book of Ages about Jane Mecom, who was Benjamin Franklin's sister. She is a woman in a time where they didn't respect women, obviously, and women weren't typically educated, but she was. Like, we only know that she existed because of letters that Benjamin Franklin sent her that people decided to keep because it was Benjamin Franklin and also because she wrote one singular book and it was called the Book of Ages and it was simply a date of birth and a date of death for everybody in her family. And basically this historian went and drew conclusions about her life based on what Ben Franklin was writing to her about and this Book of Ages and it made me so sad because um, it made me think for the first time or it made me realize, I guess, because of course I knew women's history is not something that's highlighted, especially in those times. And we don't go out of our way to look for those stories either, unless they're tied to a man. So that made me want to search out women's history and bring light to it. That's why on my TikTok I started a Badass Women in History series. It's not as like robust as I'd want it to be and the research isn't as robust as I would want it to be as well. Some of it is. I mean like I researched these really well but I didn't buy an autobiography of any of these women. Um, but it also highlighted my desire to seek out like lesser taught history or history that has been intentionally whitewashed and cherry picked in American history specifically because I am an American and there is nothing better than being critical of the government. The thing that happened in Nazi Germany was something called hypernationalism, where you'd stop criticizing the government. You know, you just were like, well, the government has the best interest in heart and I'm just gonna trust it. And I love my country. I love my country so much. Everything's great. This country's great. How dare you talk bad about it? Hypernationalism is like a really, really dangerous phenomenon. And you often hear about it in like, regards to North Korea and uh, China, like fascist states, quote unquote. But America is super, super, super hyper-nationalist, especially recently, and I would say since the second Red Scare in the 1950s. So I have been really enjoying bringing light to that side of history as well, and that's what I do on my TikTok. It just takes 
time to research these things because I do want to give well researched almost like research paper-esque style arguments um, and context. Everybody has a feeling on history that I just want to give the other side of things. If you guys liked this, well, first of all, thank you for listening to this video. This is the completed makeup look. I've been struggling with creativity and being creative and wanting to create and wanting to edit and wanting to do all these things that brought me so much joy for so long. And so I was like, I think I'm putting too much pressure on myself. I think I should just like, not dumb it down, but like not make it so complicated. Let me just do a wash, like a wash of color in my eyes. So I use this nude sticks uh, eye, eye crayon and then I just put some shimmer on it from the Danessa Myricks palette um, and it does feel good. So I think I'm gonna stop putting pressure on myself and even if I do basic makeup, like that's okay. And if I do complicated makeup, that's okay. So just trying to do my best while I'm unemployed. So thank you guys for watching this video. Thank you so much for listening. Um, subscribe if you want to. And if you want more content like this, I do have like a few others um, that I'm really excited to talk about, not just women. We can talk about like Agent Orange. We can talk about company towns. Uh, we could talk about Christopher Columbus, Pearl Harbor. Like I have a whole bunch of things that I had researched for an old podcast that is no longer on Spotify um, because me and my podcast partner just decided to stop doing it. But I have a bunch of stuff and I always love a reason to research more. So if you guys have a topic you guys want me to look into, let me know. I'll also put my TikTok below in case you want to check out any of the history content there or any of the like life content that I do. And happy International Women's Day, guys. Uh, women have been through the fucking ringer in history. I refuse to let us be hidden any longer. <laughs>